Let's begin our time of worship this morning by singing together hymn number 389 in the worship book. 389, Take My Life and Let It Be. Take our moments and our days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. I'm going to continue that thread of praise with our Old Testament scripture reading for today, which comes from Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my own most being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, Abounding in love, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As it, for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting 
to everlasting the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. This Sunday we are entering Epiphany. We have, through the Advent season, been invited to come and walk in the light. Well, the light has now come, and there we go, walking in it. It is also a season of transition in that this is the first Sunday of the new year. There are things that we are grieving, things that we are rejoicing about. And we bring all those today. We also, at this time, as a church, celebrate um, a new theme verse that will help to guide and shape our year together. And that is something that the, the pastoral team does, or works at coming to, together with at their pastoral retreat. When we were at our pastoral retreat this year, we were also thinking about um, metaphors for our life together as a body of Christ. And we've been using that metaphor, unbeknownst to you, through the Advent season, as the children's story has been lying fabrics from the lives of the Bible stories that represented common, ordinary people that were part of God's story and we, too, are part of that body of Christ here at Sonnenberg. And God brings us all together and weaves us together in his story. When we were talking about that as, um, as the pastoral team, I said, oh, it's kind of like a warp and a weft. And they said, a warp and a what? <laughs> and it's a lot like weaving. When I was an art major in college, I took a class on weaving. And so... I'd like to share with you a little bit about what goes on in weaving so you can fully understand that metaphor. This is um, a short video of the weaver at MCC Connections. You'll see the long threads that go through what's called the heddles, or those little like needle things. Those are called the warp. They're, they're tight, they don't change much. They go up and down. There might be some pattern to them as you see the blue thread, but they're pretty steady. And then there's um, the weft, and that's what you see going back and forth with the shuttle, with the weaver's hands, winding it through the warp, and together, those two fabrics make a strong, or two, two pieces, or threads, make a strong fabric. Um, meanwhile, to bring all that together, that bar that they keep pulling against it is called the beater. Um, in my idea of a metaphor as a body of Christ, I think I would call that maybe challenges or trials that God uses to bring us together, um, and, and perhaps even celebrations and things. Together this year, um, we hope to seek God's plan and follow his plan as he weaves us, Sonnenberg, together um, and part of his story along with people that have been a part of us, that perhaps are not physically present with us, or people in the biblical story that have come before us. So today, Glenn will be introducing our new uh, scripture theme for the year, and you will be invited to bring fabric during the sharing time to lay in the manger, and Marilyn Shetler has volunteered to weave that fabric together into a, into a rug that we can use throughout our year to remind ourselves of how God is weaving us together. Let's join together again in singing Songs of Epiphany. I invite you to stand as we sing 
number 32 from the Sing This Story, Purple Sing the Story. Number 32, O Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. Next song is hopefully familiar to you all. We'll be singing the song Freely, Freely. God forgave us our sins in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name.
In Jesus' name, I share his power as he told me to. Mark 2, 1 through 22 is the New Testament scripture reading this morning. A few days later, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he, that he had come home. So many gathered there, and there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some came, men came, bringing him to a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat of the paralyzed man was laying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your son sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them. All this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them as he walked along. And he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, is it not the healthy, it is not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and some of the people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse, and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. Lord bless you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Welcome to 2024. How are you feeling? I have this sense this morning that we seem tired. And, and maybe it's just me. I'm feeling a little sleep deprived. But it feels like we've, we've finally made it. Like through Christmas... And for us specifically, like, I woke up this morning, I left to come to church, and our family was still in bed, like, our company. We had Aaron's family here this weekend. So, as of this morning, our Christmases are done. So, I feel like, okay, now I can, we can look to this year. And so, yesterday was Epiphany. And I remember last year preaching a sermon on Epiphany and how, what Epiphany was and is. And it's the story of the wise men. And some in Sunday school talked about the three kings this morning. 
and how what the epiphany is, is that Jesus is a gift for the whole world. These were the pagan astrologers that saw in the stars that Jesus came. And so that's what epiphany is. It's this epiphany that Jesus is for the whole world. We are in the Gospel of Mark. And Mark just keeps moving. And that's what it seems like we're doing this morning. We are trudging ahead into 2024, whether we're ready or not. And Marlon launched us into Mark, back into Mark last week. You know, I, do you remember back in September, the first Sunday in September, I introduced the Gospel of Mark. So this year we're preaching through Mark, and I was in the Old Testament all fall and brought in plenty of Old New Testament passages from Mark and Jesus in the Old Testament as well. But last Sunday, Marlon preached now for the first time back in Mark. And he had a lot to cover in, what was it, 21 verses? And there was like three different passages that could have had their own sermon, and I have the same thing this morning. Three different passages in these 22 verses that could have three different sermons. I'm going to try to preach just one sermon. But there's a lot going on, and it seems symbolic, because Mark just keeps moving through. And we have a lot of things that are coming up in the next number of weeks. We have Winter Wednesdays starting here in January. February 2nd is the Marriage for Life Conference. That's in less than a month. February 10th on Saturday, planning the chosen outing to go see the first three episodes of season four, which you need to sign up. Let me know. We'll order tickets. And then February 14th is Ash Wednesday, and Lent begins. In like five weeks, we have Lent upon us, because Easter is early this year. We have Ohio Conference ACA the first week in March. Easter's March 31st, so that's about as early as Easter can be. And by the end of May, we're at Pentecost. We're at Pentecost. Not Pentecost, Pentecost. You can't Mennonite Pentecost. And so, looking at the worship schedule, it seems like, how can I be looking at June already? That seems too soon. How soon is June going to be here? So, we'll be done preaching through Mark at Easter. And then we'll have the New Testament and then summer sermon series. So, thinking about everything that lies ahead, are you ready? Let's go. Let's go. And personally, I'm just tired. I woke up this morning and, like, I feel sleep-deprived. And so I know how many times it's been mentioned about uh, my glenergy. And, you know, and I, I have the, the trust and hope that those who re- wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And so may, may we all do that. May we all trust in the Lord for the strength to sustain us as we trudge forward into this new year. Welcome 2024. Um, in Mark 1, 15, from last week's passage, Jesus announced the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And we've had this theme, come walk in the light. And does anyone recognize, I think we mentioned it, maybe, I think Michelle mentioned it the first Sunday of Advent. Do you, do you all recognize what that chapel is? You know, who, whose chapel that is? That is Anna's chapel. So Peter and Leanna Dunn, their daughter, daughter Anna, who died of cancer, they made this chapel at P. Graham Dunn in her honor. And we have hanging out in our foyer that beautiful blue quilt um, that was dedicated to Anna. And so I went and sat in this chapel this week, and I got one of the programs that they have in there. And it is, they built this as a replica of the chapel that Anna and Joe encountered in Flagstaff, Arizona. And the picture, it looks like she was already sick when they visited, but they they built this as a replica exactly of that. And then there's a picture of, they encourage everyone to sign. There's there's people signing all kinds of things, of things they're thankful for, um, remembering loss of loved ones. And 
what Anna signed, I believe, it says, thanks for life, was what she wrote as her life was coming to an end. And so, sitting in that chapel this week, and then thinking about how this has been what we, our invitation, all Advent, Christmas, and now Epiphany, come walk in the light. And as Michelle mentioned, the light has come. So, our new passage that will guide us this year is Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. So this invitation to come walk in the light, the light has come, we are going to discuss what does it mean to seek the kingdom of God. And there's all kinds of ways Jesus described what the kingdom of God is like. And we will explore that the first couple of Winter Wednesdays. We're going to have some some times that we will discuss and press into that. The kingdom of God. What does it look like to seek the kingdom of God? And what do we have to celebrate? What are some things that we celebrate as a congregation? That's some of the focus that we will have moving forward. Mark chapter 2. If you want to turn in your, in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2, you will see a few of the things that we're going to cover on what Jesus is calling us to. The first passage there is Jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man. And Jesus enters back into Capernaum, and they think, and they see that he has come home. Jesus is in his home stomping grounds for this interaction. They gathered in such large numbers, so Jesus had caused a stir enough that when people heard that Jesus came back, they gathered, and they gathered in large numbers, so much that there was not even space for people to get in to see him. And here we have this group of likely four men carrying a paralyzed guy on a mat. And they couldn't get to him. And so what did they do? The crowds didn't stop him. And likely the homes had an outdoor staircase to get up onto the roof. They would use their roofs as like more space of their home. And the roofs were likely made of thatch or mud or timber, and they, it says they dug a hole in the roof to lower this man on a mat. Seems destructive. It seems like a big deal. It seems like they were not going to be stopped. And when they lowered the mat that was lying, lowered the man that was lying on the mat, it says when, in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. We've talked about the chosen, and a number of us have seen it. And there is a character that the chosen brings into the story. Her name's Tamar, or Tamar. And Jesus, in the chosen episode, looks directly at her and says, your faith is beautiful. So when it says Jesus saw their faith, and then he said to the paralyzed man, they had the faith strong enough to know that it's worthwhile going to all these measures because we know Jesus can heal our friend. I have a chosen calendar that someone gave to me in my office. If you walk by my door, you'll see a picture of Tamar on, Jan on January, and it says, your faith is beautiful. Now, there are some teachers of the law that were sitting there thinking to themselves, how can Jesus say that the sins are forgiven? Because they're not sold that Jesus is the Son of God. For him to say this, to be truly divine, they think this is blasphemy. But anytime someone comes to Jesus with a need, he doesn't just take care of the thing that they want taken care of. He knows the deeper need. 
Now, like, obviously he's paralyzed. They brought him to heal him. But what does he say first? Your sins are forgiven. Mark likes to use the word immediately. Things are happening really quickly. Immediately, in verse 8, Jesus knew in his spirit what they were thinking in their hearts. And he says to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is, which is easier to say to this man, to this paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. Now, what's interesting in Luke, here it switches in verse 10 and it says that he says this to the man, not to those that he's berating. He's saying, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He's proclaiming it. He's going to get himself in some hot water. But he tells him to get up. And he tells him to take his mat and to go home. And the people have never seen anything like this. When Jesus shows up, he has changed everything. Teachers of the law don't know how to take him. In the next passage as well, I've, I've shared with a number of people about communication, how 45% of communication is body language, and 38% is tone. We have the text here, which leaves us 18% of this story being communicated. I would so love to see what Jesus' body language was like and the tone with which he spoke to those teachers of the law. You all know I'm a seven. I'm the enthusiast. I realize that I am aggressive. I love, well, I shouldn't say I love. So many of us don't like being wrong. I don't like being wrong. We like proving other people wrong when they say something wrong, or like these teachers of the law, their hearts couldn't accept Jesus forgiving sins. Naturally, I put Jesus into this tone of smugly putting them in their place. But I wonder what Jesus' tone was like. I doubt it's as aggressive as I want it to be. I think Jesus is the epitome of compassion. He knows the hearts of everyone there. And he's going to do what's best for everyone. They bring this man, and what does he need? Sure, he needs healed. But he forgives his sins and I want Jesus to take the tone and tell those teachers of the law and put them in their place. But is Jesus taking that tone? I don't know. I'm probably wrong in my first inclination because that's just how I want to be. Was Jesus more compassion? Was he more compassionate as he's explaining to these teachers of the law who were not in the right place with their hearts? What was his body language like? I appreciate the chosen trying to depict that scene. But they're just trying to guess too. They even added a character that we don't see is there. What was that, see, that scene like? And how would that ripple through the crowds? It says they've never seen anything like this. But how did Jesus say these words? How did the people feel? as this scene played out. Next scene. Jesus calls Levi and eats with sinners. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, how does he teach a crowd as he walks along? That's Mark. Thought we're going. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting in the, at the tax collector's booth. This is Levi, known as Matthew, the tax collector, one of the twelve. And Jesus says, follow me. 
Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. I've talked about this scene already a couple times. All right, I'm wearing my shirt again. This is where the tagline of season one comes from. Get used to different. I've had the poster on my door, like, since I came. When Jesus calls Matthew, Levi, as Mark calls him, we just don't, we can't, we can't understand. We can't understand what this is like. All right. I was talking with Nate a little bit just before the service started. And we're picturing this band of ruffians, these disciples that Jesus calls. And you've got these fishermen, all right? They're just average Jews, okay? He's not inviting the teachers of the law. He's not getting these theological, renowned experts. Most of them are this band of ruffians. And then he calls Levi. Levi is this tax collector, which most Jews probably hated just as much, maybe, as the Romans. Because the tax collectors were Jews, but collaborating with the Romans to bleed their own people dry of taxes. Usually they did not, they were, it's, it's understood that they were mostly dishonest, getting more than they needed, but the Jews just hated them. And the chosen really shows this well. Levi or Matthew was despised by the Jews. One of their own, bleeding their own people dry of taxes for the Romans, which they hated as their oppressors. And Jesus calls one to be one of the disciples? Oof! Can't imagine how this group tried to get along. There was even a zealot in the group, Simon the Zealot. But all the other Jews, I mean, it's funny how in this scene... Simon Peter is just, he's, he's flabbergasted. He cannot believe Jesus is calling Matthew or Levi to be one of the disciples. He's so mad. <laughs> and he's telling Jesus, he's telling Jesus, you don't understand Jesus. You, you, don't, you, you know who you're calling? He's asking Jesus if he knows who he's calling. And then, What's funny is when Matthew or Levi gets called to be one of the disciples, Jesus says, hey, we're going to have a party tonight. And Matthew says in the scene, I'm not usually welcome at parties. Jesus says, that won't be a problem this time because you're the host. And the next verse, Jesus is having dinner at Levi's house. Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Jesus has quite the following. He's offering a message that that people haven't heard before. They're invited to this way of life where they are valued, not by their status, not by their appearance, not by their possessions. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? It's a fair question. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. How do you see yourself? Are you one of the righteous or are you one of the sinners? It pains me to think I would have been likely one of those teachers of the law. I've got my seminary degree. I don't like being wrong. What's going on here? And Jesus says, 
Look who he's hanging out with. He's hanging out with the tax collectors and the sinners. He has come for them. They have heard this good news and they have responded. Are we the righteous ones? Because the ones that think they're righteous are the ones that don't get it and don't follow Jesus. How do you perceive yourself? Are we the self-righteous proclaimed ones? Or do you realize that you are a sinner? Because if you do, then the message is good news. Otherwise, it wasn't good news. Have you experienced this need for grace? Where and when have you felt that? Holy cow, I need to be forgiven. If you have never or don't ever get to that point of humbly realizing, I need forgiven, you're in the category of the righteous as you see yourself. And that's not who Jesus came and ate with. Eating with people was a big deal. If you ate with someone, it means you condoned them, you approved of them, and you were okay with their life. Because the Jews would not eat with someone who would make them unclean. And Jesus is eating with them. And they're like, this makes no sense. He's eating with, he's this Jewish rabbi, he's a teacher, he's, he's putting us all in our place, and he's doing stuff that we say has been wrong. Moses' law forbids us to welcome non-Jews into our home to eat supper together. And here Jesus is eating with his whole band of tax collectors and sinners. It made no sense. And look at the next passage. Jesus is questioned about fasting. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Again, this doesn't make any sense. Jesus answered, because like they would fast, the Pharisees would fast like twice a week, from what I understand. There was only like one festival throughout the Jewish calendar where it was specifically for fasting, but the Pharisees or teachers of the law would practice this twice a week, and they saw that Jesus' disciples didn't do this. And they're like, hey, this is another thing that we know or think is the right thing to do, and your, and your disciples aren't doing it. Why is that? And Jesus' answer, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and on that day they will fast. He uses this idea of a banquet, of a wedding feast, because they knew how to celebrate weddings. They were like a week long. Fasting at a wedding made no sense because you feasted for like a week. There would be eating and drinking, and it was a joyous occasion. So Jesus used this example to say, it'd be like the bridegroom's, It'd be like the guests of the bridegroom fasting at a wedding. I'm here, Jesus says. I'm here and they're with me. And when Jesus is here, when you're with Jesus, it's a party. It's a party. It is fantastic. It is celebration and it is feasting. Now he says there'll be a time when the bridegroom will be taken away and then fasting will be needed. But when Jesus is around, it is not the time to fast. And he explains with this whole idea of new wineskins. Two examples there. You don't, pat, you don't sew a patch on an unshrunk cloth of an old garment. It'll pull away and the tear will be worse. You know, the new cloth has to shrink or stretch. The old cloth isn't going to do any. You can't fasten in a different kind of patch to a different kind of cloth. There will be tears. It will rip and make it worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins. We don't ever, whoever, who does this? It's, these are things we're not familiar with, is wineskins. 
There are still cultures, I think I've seen some in Europe, these wineskins that have been made out of like animal skin or lining. It's kind of gross. I don't know if it's the stomach lining of a goat or something like that. Where an age old, they'd have them for maybe centuries old. But if you'd have old wine in this, it could age and last for a long time. But if you pour new wine into an old wineskin, you know, it's still fermenting and it would burst the skins. What's he talking about here? What's the analogy? You understand this? What's not fitting? Jesus isn't fitting into their old way of thinking. They have their cultures, their culture, their expectations. They've got their rituals. They have their practices. They have their laws that they have followed for a long time. And Jesus shows up, and he is something different. He is something new. And he's explaining, I'm not fitting in, I'm not going to fit into your old way of life. You're going to need a new perspective to grasp the teachings that I have. What has to change? Is it your thinking? Is it your heart? Thinking about each of these these passages, my message for you is to do what Jesus is doing. Look at the first one. Jesus forgives and he heals. How is how is God calling you to heal and forgive? What areas, what people in your life, who might you encounter that you need to do these things? How can you offer healing and forgiveness as Jesus models it? What do you you have to do? Healing, whether we're praying for people, whether it is healing in relationships and forgiveness, That's what I believe we are to do, to heal and forgive in any places that we are able. And the second part, Jesus calls Levi and eats with sinners. It's really comfortable to have our friends over from church and eat with them. And I'm convicted that's who I want to have. I want to have all of you over to my house. But who is, who is Jesus calling you to befriend and eat with? That might be labeled the outcast. That might be labeled the sinner. That could be as badly seen as the tax collectors. And are you willing to take the ridicule and the mocking and the accusations of others that are like, who are they hanging out with? Well, how did Jesus model that? Who is he calling us to befriend and eat with? Jesus has this following. He's expanding the church. The church is exploding. The followers grow and grow because they're seeing this new way of life that Jesus models. I'm not sure what to think about the fasting part. Because I want to say how and when and where is Jesus with us? In the things that we do, like he's with us all the time. His presence is with us. The Holy Spirit is a comforter that is with us. And if Jesus is with us, I said it is a party. And we have cause to celebrate. Now, Jesus was also taken from us. There are times for us to fast. So I say both are needed. There are times for us to fast. I don't fast much. I don't know how many of us fast much. I think fasting is a very important practice that we may need to press into. But we also need to celebrate. 
And that's part of what we want to do as we come and walk forward into the light because the light has come. And as we seek first God's kingdom, we want to talk about how do we celebrate. And if we are celebrating, I want to say it's because Jesus is with us. The times when we recognize Jesus' presence with us, we have cause to celebrate. We have things that we do that are God is with us in them. And it's a party. In each of these passages, this is what we are to do and model what Jesus did for us. I love that song that we sang, Winfred, Freely, Freely. You have received freely, freely give. And one of the last lines of the chorus says, Because you believe, others will know. Sometimes it's not easy to have faith. Sometimes we're relying on God's faith for us. But faith is stepping out even when you can't see or know beyond a shadow of a doubt, faith is believing. Faith is taking that next step, even if you're unsure. Faith is still moving forward. So as Mark invites us, and as we look to this future, let's go. Let's go together. Let's walk in the light because the light has come. And let's do what Jesus models. In Jesus' name. As a hymn of response, I invite you to turn to number 30 in the green Sing the Journey hymnal. Number 30, Jesus Christ is waiting. During this song, we are going to uh, have the kids do the My Coin Counts collection, so be prepared for that.